Thank you, Byron. All right, you can turn the lights back up. Good morning, Cornerstone. Go ahead and turn your Bibles over to Hebrews chapter 11. Get my clock on right. Make sure we get, it's Mother's Day. I know you want to take your mother out to lunch. So we're going to get you out of here on time today. Let's start this clock. All right. Here we go. Well, happy Mother's Day. Feliz Dia de las Madres. <laughs> All right. I am so excited. You know, I love Mother's Day because I have a mom. <laughs> and my mom is amazing. I'm so grateful for all of, like, like Chloe's poem. That was great, dear. I love that poem. She wrote that and said, hey, Dad, I'd love to read this. And just all the things she said about mothers being there when you have a broken bone or wiping away tears or singing a lullaby to you. You know, our moms are just special to us. And so it's so amazing to be able to celebrate mothers today with all of you. Got a, uh, I know some moms that are particularly encouraged today. Uh, yesterday I heard there was this amazing baby shower. <laughs> so Boomy, she's having twins, all right, a boy and a girl. And Natasha told me that, you know, we just had so many people show up and just... Natasha said, I was worried if she was going to be able to fit all the gifts in her car or not, because so many people just came and gave and served, and it was a really, really great time. So let's continue to pray for Boomy. They've already got two girls, and now they're going to have a, a, a girl and a boy. So be praying for them, her and Alfred there. Uh, let's see. Noel Higgins is probably pretty fired up. <laughs> So, Noelle, I'm going to have you go ahead and stand on up. So, I'm sure her mom, Cheryl, and her dad, Chris, are so excited. Her mom is particularly fired up because she was baptized into Christ last week. <laughs> so, that's amazing. It's a part of the Georgia State Ministry over there. So, we're just so excited uh, to see our young people make a decision to follow Jesus. And I know your mom and dad are particularly excited. And we're just so grateful for all the, all the ways you poured into her over her whole life. You know, I mean, uh, disciples are made. They aren't just born. You know, they get born again because God uses us to reach out to people and, and tell them about his love, starting with our own children. Right? That's your first mission field, in case it's not clear. Right? Your own children are who you ought to be making disciples of first. So that's so exciting. I'm so excited for you, Noel. Um, some other good news for moms. So you might have heard the announcement last week. We are going to be adding a part-time staff member, a family ministry coordinator. And so what that role is going to be about is really to help oversee and work with our Kids Rock program and Creation Station programs. Okay? So I know that Jim and Cindy have stepped in and done an amazing job with Kids Rock. So grateful for them. And uh, if, you know, if your kid has ever been in Creation Station, you know Kathy Jack is a jewel from God. You know, she is, she is amazing. You know, these children are like her children. She really is a mother to a lot of your preschoolers. And so what we want to do is just get them some help. All right? We want to have somebody that can help coordinate those ministries, help with the orange curriculum, coordinate when we go to conferences and things like that. Jenna Costa did an amazing job organizing everybody going to orange. Uh, but Jen already has like three or four jobs or something like that, you know. And so we really are trying to just get some help for our staff. So if you're interested, if you love kids, right, and you love God, all right, and you have some uh, extra time or you'd like to, you've always had a dream to maybe be in children's ministry or work with children's ministry. We do have an opening. So you can see me. Uh, the committee is made up of, I think it's uh, Jim and Cindy and Kathy Jack and Tim and Jen. Hope I'm not missing anybody. That's the committee. So you can see any one of us and we can get you the job description and we'd love to get that position filled by this summer, okay, before we go into the fall school year. Another thing you should be excited about if you're a mom here today, we're going to have some summer interns. <laughs> So I am particularly excited about this. We're going to have three interns working with our Edge and Gravity Ministries, three, three working with the teens, and we're going to have one intern working with our campus ministry. And so I'm super excited about that. I wanted to give you a brief introduction to each of them, and I'd ask you to start praying for them. 
They're going to be here that, that uh, like Lauren announced, we're going to have a party on that last day of school that evening. Pardon me, we're going to have a party, and that's going to be their first event. So it'll be a good chance to get to know them. But you can start praying for them now. All right, so we can go ahead and be praying for them. We can go ahead and go to the next slide today. They told me my clicker isn't working. You know, I give up the pulpit for one week in Hamilton. I come back and my, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, shout out to Hamilton. He did an amazing job last week <laughs> preaching to us. I was over at Northview, and, and he feel, didn't even feel, he just did an amazing job. So, brother, I've heard nothing but great things, and uh, people are really excited about using your gifts for God. And so, he's actually going to be, him and his wife, as well as Heather Futrell, they're going to be doing a mental health workshop for, for our uh, teen families. And so, that's going to be coming up. Kenson and Carly are going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, just thank you so much, brother, for, for doing an amazing job. So, our interns, the first is David Fields. Uh, David is a junior studying sociology at Georgia State University. He's a kingdom kid, and he, he's, he grew up in the Atlanta Church of Christ in Gwinnett, over there where, where Kenson and Shayla came from. And he's been a disciple over a year. Uh, and like I said, he's studying at Georgia State, and he says, I'm excited to have the opportunity to give to the Cornerstone teens this summer and to grow with them. So David Fields is a great young man, excited to have him. He's um, actually a part of the Georgia State ministry over there with Noel. So he grew up going to ACLC Gwinnett. Oh, we got some more Georgia State, Georgia State folks here, the Snyders. And um, so David's going to be here this summer. Next slide. We've also got Sarah Brooks. So Sarah is 21 years old. She lives in Charleston, South Carolina. She's a junior at Trident Technical College. And she's studying advertisement and marketing and hopes to transfer to College of Charleston very soon. Said her favorite things to do are to be in nature, to watch movies, and to read Harry Potter. So uh, she's been a disciple about three years, and she was raised in the Columbia Church of Christ. She says, I can't wait to spend the summer with the church and to learn and grow. She's going to be staying with Jim and Cindy, so we're really excited about that. She's coming down from Carolina. Next slide. I'm sure you know this young lady, Caroline Rigdon. So Caroline is, she says, I'm so excited to intern with the Cornerstone Teens this summer. She's a junior at UGA, pursuing a major in public relations, and she's currently an RA at Russell Hall. She says, go dogs. That is her quote, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> says, having grown up a Cornerstone kid myself, I'm really looking forward to strengthening old relationships and investing in new ones. Cornerstone has given so much to me. It's an absolute honor to be chosen to serve the teens. And so that's really exciting. I'm just so grateful to our board, to our leadership, uh, the leadership team for allowing us to have interns. Originally, we were just going to have two, but we've got a lot of teens. Particularly, we've got, a, I think, 11 middle schoolers are moving up to high school. We're going to have 11 seniors next year and 11 ninth graders. And so we're going to be top and bottom heavy. And so we thought a lot of those are, are, are girls. And so we thought, let's get another female intern. We're going to have two, two interns, two female interns working with our teens, and David's going to be working with our young men. Next slide. For our campus intern, we've got Tyler Washington. Tyler's 18 years old, and he's a sophomore at the University of North, Georgia, North Georgia. His major is kinea, uh, kinea, oh, good Lord, kinesiology. <laughs> And he plans on becoming a physical therapist. He's a kingdom kid, and he was baptized in 2017. He said, Cornerstone is probably the sister church I'm the least familiar with, but I'm pumped to grow closer to this church and help the campus students who call this amazing church home. So he's going to be working with our campus students. So Wes, Christine, Abby, all of you that are home for the summer, all the college students that are home for the summer, we're going to have some campus activities going on. So it's going to be really, really excited. So Again, we've got David Fields, Sarah Brooks, Caroline Rigdon, and Tyler Washington. Please be praying for them. They will be here in a week and a half, and I'm so excited to have some interns working with our young people at Cornerstone this year. You can go to the next slide. So our theme this year has been by faith, and last week Hamilton talked about Gideon and the story of Gideon, how that's a story of faith. Well, there are two particular stories in this list over in Hebrews 11 that quite frankly, they're head scratchers to me. I don't really know in some ways why they're considered stories of faith. Because if you look at some of these characters and you look at their story, it doesn't actually seem like they're super faithful people. One of which is Sarah. So over in Hebrews 11:11, 11, 11, it says this about Sarah, Abraham's wife. 
It says, by faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. Now, reading that last sentence, if you know the story about what happens when God comes and says, hey, you're going to have a, you're going to have a child, what does Sarah do? She laughs about it. <laughs> and her husband's like, you know, God's like, why did she laugh? And Sarah goes, I didn't laugh. And Abraham's like, yes, you did laugh. God doesn't lie. And on top of that, when it seems like it's taking a while, she tells Abraham, hey, just take my maidservant and, and sleep with her and have a child through her. And not once but twice do Abraham and, and Sarah lie about their relationship, about being husband and wife, because they're afraid for their life. And so looking at Sarah and just these three snippets of her life, it doesn't really seem like you'd say she's super faithful. But we're going to look at why the Bible calls her faithful. The second story, next slide, is over in Hebrews eleven twenty. it says, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. Now, if you know this story, Jacob conspiring with his mother. <laughs> it's Mother's Day after all. <laughs> We're going to tell this story. <laughs> conspiring with his mother decides to steal his brother's blessing. And they concoct this conniving plan to steal Esau's blessing. And so I always look at this story like, why is this one listed? This is a story in my brain of, of deception. How did he get blessed and he didn't do the right, they didn't do the right thing? And so we're going to talk about these two stories briefly and look at some pointers today on a sermon that I like to call, By Faith, Mothers, Fathers, and Children. By Faith, Mothers, Fathers, and Children. So if you look at the next slide, point number one today, I want you to think about, point number one for everybody in the audience, love your mom. <laughs> Yeah, you're his mom's in the room. Love your mom. All right, love your mom. There's a verse over in Ephesians 6. And, you know, I'm sure every parent in this room has gone to this with their children at some point and said, this is a scripture you need to obey. Right. So we're going to read it. In Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right, teens, middle schoolers. It says, Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Raise your hand if you have a mom. All right, everybody's got a mom. Everybody's got a mom. And we need to love those mothers. We need to, to listen to mom. We need to obey mom and dad. We need to behave. Here's the thing. Parents aren't perfect. They're people. And so your mom and dad, sometimes they're going to make a mistake or several mistakes. I've done it a lot. Oh, she said they don't make mistakes. Don't, don't tell them we don't make mistakes. <laughs> I thought she was like, you're talking too loud, Fenton. Calm down. <laughs> but parents aren't perfect. Sometimes we make mistakes. And so we need a lot of grace. And so here's the challenge. And I can imagine this is a challenge. You see your parents grow up. They say, hey, they're disciples of Jesus. They say they love God. And they do a lot of probably great things for God and for other people and for you. But in your household, you see all kind of stuff that nobody else sees. It's like, preach, bro. <laughs> like sometimes mom and dad maybe lose their temper. <laughs> Never. <laughs> sometimes mom and dad forget things that are important to you. <laughs> sometimes mom and dad take your phones away <laughs> and so what happens is it can be this sort of weird position where you're like but they say they love Jesus and but I see this what I feel like is this other side to them and I'll just say to you all they're not perfect but you know who is perfect God and in his perfect wisdom, he gave this one command that actually has a promise. None of the other commands come with a promise if you look at the Ten Commandments. It says, if you obey your father and mother, it will go well with you and you'll have long life. That's a promise from God. It's a promise. And God's promises are like, go, it's money in the bank. You can take it and know that he will fulfill his promises. 
And so, children, when your mom asks you to do the chores, do your chores. <laughs> do your chores even when you haven't been asked to do them. Matter of fact, sometimes you can even do the chores of your brothers and sisters for them to be encouraging. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's the thing. Eat your dinner even if you don't like what was cooked. Go to bed on time. <laughs> Fortnite will be there tomorrow when you come home from school. <laughs> but you know, this is not just, I think, for, for what we would consider small children, but even adult children. Do we take care of our parents as they age? It's very interesting. In 1 Timothy 5, there's a scripture that talks about the church really tried to look after widows. Because in this society, a lot of times men would die early. And so you would have a lot of widows that were left behind. And, and Paul writes to Tim, Timothy and he says, support widows who are genuinely in need. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them learn to practice godliness toward their own family first and to repay their parents for this pleases God. Now take care of our parents as they get older. This is a, let's be honest, this is a society that likes to throw people away when they get a certain age. Forget about them. Act like they no longer have value at a certain age. And so we need to take care of them. We need to, point number one, you need to love your mom. I love how this verse ends. It, it, really, it talks to the fathers, and Kenson did an amazing sermon on this a couple of months ago. But one of the ways I want to encourage the fathers, the dads, the husbands in the room is, you know, help the wife and mother of your children. The Bible says you're supposed to raise your children in the Lord. Lead your household. Just like I told the children, husbands, do your chores. Right? When, I, when we get with couples, probably 90% of arguments boil down to one of three things. People are arguing about finances. They're arguing about their intimacy and either frequency or lack thereof. And they're arguing about their husbands, lack thereof doing chores. Probably 90% of the times when you get with people, that's what couples are arguing about. So how can we love our mom? How can we love the mothers of our children? Help them out. Give your wife some time to herself. One of the things Natasha loves to do, she loves when I take the girls away for the weekend at my parents' house. She, you know, if you've ever seen that movie Date Night, it's with Steve Carell and, and Tina Fey. There's a part in there where, you know, Tina Fey says, you know what my fantasy is, honey? She says, it's to go sit in a hotel by myself and just lay on the bed with no one talking to me. You know, give your wife some time for herself. Give her some free time. Say, I'll take care of dinner today. It's Mother's Day. I hope you're taking care of dinner today, brothers, in the room, or at least paying for it. <laughs> you know, help fold some laundry. I told Natasha, you know, honey, on Sunday afternoon, I'm going to do the laundry. <laughs> she doesn't love how I fold the clothes, but, you know, I'm going to help out. Another way that you can really help the mother of your children, is you need to let your children know that mom comes first. We live in a society that likes to say, oh, just me and my kids. Or if this person upsets me, you know, this could end one day, but I'm going to forever have my kids. Which is true, but if you look at how God talks about marriage in the Bible, marriage always comes before parenting as a principle, as a general rule. When you think about what God did to Job or allowed to happen to Job, right? said, you can't touch him, right? He had boils on him. All his property was lost. All his children were lost. Satan didn't touch his wife. Wasn't allowed to mess with his wife. You look over and over again in Scripture. If you have a great marriage, the way you can be great parents is by being great spouses. It starts there. God honors marriage and says, let the marriage bed be undefiled. Honor marriage. So interesting. We live, in, again, in a place where people like to say, well, the grass is, is, is greener on the other side. A little tip somebody told me one time. The grass is greenest where you water it. If you invest in your marriage, you invest in your relationship, it will be great. You put the other person in front of yourself, it will be great. Don't, we can go to the next slide. Husbands, don't let your wife become a mom bee. What's a mom be? A mom zombie. It's a mom who is beyond exhausted 
but stays up late anyhow since it's her only opportunity for kid-free time. This is big in our household. A lot of times Natasha's like, I just need, once the kids are bad, I just need to, some me time. I just need to read a book, watch TV, veg out, just chill. But part of that for us husbands is, is, to, is to take care of some of that burden in the household, to give our moms these times. So they're not staying up super late and then having to get up early and get the kids off the school and make dinner. Oh, and a lot of them work, right? Your wife is going to be a mommy if you're not helping out, brothers. So don't let this happen. Talking about the story of Jacob and Esau. So again, Esau was the firstborn son. We talked about this before. Firstborn sons had certain rights in this society. Everything was going to be left to them. It's not like today where in your will you say, all right, 33.3 repeating is going to this kid and 33.3 repeating to this one and, and to the third one. In this society, you pretty much put everything into the firstborn. And he was going to basically take over and be the patriarch of the family after you were gone. And so Esau was the firstborn and had these rights. But the thing about Esau was, you look at him, he just kind of didn't care. Carly sent me this really amazing podcast about this story, and we can send it out to everybody. Just some guys explaining this story a little bit, and why, why did God let them basically deceive Esau and let Jacob take his birthright? And there were sort of no consequences for it. And ultimately, it's because Esau was a guy that didn't care about his responsibilities. He was very frivolous. Quite frankly, he wasn't probably the guy that you wanted to leave all that stuff to. And so when you look at why would, why would Rebecca conspire with her other son to get Jacob the blessing, go to the next slide. This is the verse right before a lot of this happens. Over in Genesis chapter 26, it says, When Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives Judah's daughter of Beeri the Hethite and Basmath, daughter of Elon the Hethite. They made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. He went and did something that he basically knew would tick off his parents. He married some foreign, foreign women. And, you know, we talk, we make a lot of jokes in society about in-laws and that whole deal. But it says here, seriously, they made life bitter for his parents. And so Rebecca's thinking, we're going to leave everything to him and these women? And so she's like, we've got to figure this out, Jacob. Because Jacob was a guy, despite being a deceiver, he had a lot of heart for God. He was a guy that would go on to wrestle with God. He would be the father of the patriarchs. And he was not perfect, but he was a lot better suited for the task. And so here's the thing, children out there. If you have brothers and sisters, I know one thing is true, because I have brothers and sisters. You probably think your parents have a favorite. <laughs> And being a parent myself, I can tell you, parents love their kids equally, but differently. They love their kids. I think parents, amen? Yeah. Yeah. You love your kids equally, but differently. And so, really looking at this story, I want to give you one piece of advice. Don't tempt your parents to have a favorite. <laughs> because, I mean, that's what Esau did. He was just kind of a jerk. And frivolous and flying off the handle. Again, your parents aren't perfect. And I know they love you. I know they care about you. Do your best to obey your parents in the Lord. Amen? Amen. And so, point number one here is love your mom. You've only got one mom. And we know life, particularly Cornerstone knows this well. Tomorrow is for real, not promised talking to Kim, Tim Kinsey before service today, and I didn't realize this. He, he lost his mom at 38 years old. I'm 38 years old. And I told him, I said, I couldn't imagine. I mean, he was totally not expecting it. She was there, and then she got sick, and then she wasn't. So if you've got a mom in your life, love your mom. Pray for your mother. Pray with your mother. Take some time to spend with your mother. Ask your mom to read you her favorite story from the scriptures. Read your favorite story from the scriptures to your mom. But point number one is love your mom. Point number two, next slide. To the moms in the room, love your husbands and children. Over in 1 Peter chapter 3, it says this. Well, for time's sake, I won't read the whole deal, but Peter is talking about 
Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. It says, don't let your beauty come from outward things like fine jewelry or, or fine clothes or braided hair, but from an inward beauty, a gentle and quiet spirit. And then it gets to this part right here in, in verse 5. It says, for in the past, the holy women who put their hope in God also adorned themselves in this way, submitting to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You have become her children when you do what is good and do not fear any intimidation. Come on, Fenton, it's Mother's Day. How are you going to read this scripture to us? It's supposed to be encouraging, uplifting. But we said at the outset we wanted to look at what was it about Sarah that she was actually praised for. Why would she end up in the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11? And if you look at this, it was based on her relationship with her husband and her children. At that society, the role she had in that society was to be a wife and a mother. And that was her role. And even though she had her doubts and she had her imperfections, it says she, you know, she went after it. One of the best ways to love your children is to respect their father and to show them what biblical marriage and parenting looks like. Ephesians 5 says that the relationship between a husband and a wife reflects the relationship of Christ in the church. When you have a biblical marriage relationship, your kids get greater insight into who Jesus is. When you have a biblical marriage relationship, your kids get greater insight into what Jesus is like. So yes, again, this is a tough calling, right? We look at the scripture and in our society, what, she obeyed Abraham? She called him master or called him Lord? How are you going to read that, Fenton? It's the 21st century. But the principles are timeless. Just like a society that says you should put children before the marriage while the Bible says otherwise, here's another one. Society says you don't need to submit to anybody. And it doesn't mean that you're not equal partners. If you keep reading on, Peter gives a very strong challenge to the men there. It says, consider your wives. Remember how this verse ends with, with Peter saying, husbands, consider your wives. I'm going to read it here. Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with a weaker partner, showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. What, the quickest way, brothers, for your prayers to be hindered is to not be considerate to your wife. God says, I won't stand for it. How are we doing in that respect? So husbands and dad in the room, dads in the room, don't lord it over your wives and children. And quite frankly, do your best to not make stupid decisions. Look at the next slide here. Love this meme. The boy says, Dad, why is my sister's name Rose? Because your mother loves roses. Good to know. Thanks, Dad. No problem, flame-grilled flame Whopper. <laughs> so his favorite thing is obviously a flame-grilled Whopper. And I've seen this meme with several things inserted, Marvel or, you know, Fortnite even. That'll be one probably 20 years from now. We'll see. Um, but brothers, co-heirs, these type of decisions happen when you're lording it over because no wife is going to say, yeah, let's name our son Flame Grilled Whopper. <laughs> right? Sometimes we're adventurers and God put that spirit in us, right? And sometimes we need, we need to be reined in a little bit. And so that's why God has given The only, it's so interesting. We look at creation, all the things God creates. There's only one time when he says something is not good. It's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for him to rule alone. We're co-heirs, the gracious gift of life. So, again, some of you may be saying, well, Fenton, you're not a woman. You're not a wife. How can you talk to us about this scripture? What do you know about it? And, and again, you're right. I don't. I'm just reading the scriptures. I am not an expert, but many of you are, which is why I think this next verse is in the Bible. Look at the next slide here. In Titus chapter 2. It says, in the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not slaves to excessive drinking. They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind, and in submission to their husbands so that God's word will not be slandered. See, I'm not an expert, but a lot of you are. A lot of you in the room are. 
I talk all the time about when we get with Greg and Vicky and all the wisdom that, that, that Vicky likes to pour into Natasha. Had an amazing conversation with Pam Hanna this week and just learned, you know, she was talking about basically leadership. And she was talking about when she went over to the Duluth Co-op and she took some people with her. And I said, that's leadership. And we were talking about what life was like for her in her home and some things, some wisdom that she would love to impart to other people. I'm not an expert. Pam Hanna's an expert. Had a great conversation with Laurel, Ken- Laurel Kinsey this week. We were talking about uh, women's leadership and talking about midweeks. And I, you know, you probably heard uh, Shayla and Rebecca are doing the midweek lesson this coming week. And so you might ask, well, doesn't this verse say the older women should teach the younger? Why are they leading the lesson? And so I, asked, I actually asked Laurel about this. I said, what is, your, what is your take on this? And Laurel said something so, so profound. She said, you know, one of the ways that we can train people is by giving them opportunities. Giving them an opportunity to speak and share and then talking to them afterwards, giving them feedback. Laura was like, when I was 25 years old, I was working in the ministry. Are we giving these opportunities? That's one of the reasons it's so awesome and so important and, and I think amazing that we have Women's Midweek. It gives a chance for this to take place. It gives a space for this to take place. In addition to, obviously, your life groups, right? In your life groups, this needs to be taking place. But also, this is an opportunity for women to teach women. And so when we have them, like we do this midweek at 7 o'clock, women, I hope you show up. My third and final point in the next slide is that, yes, your mother loves you, and yes, you love your mother, but God loves you more, which is very hard to believe sometimes. Look at this verse here. It says in in Isaiah 49, Zion says, the Lord has abandoned me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child or lack compassion for the child of her womb? Even if these forget, yet I will not forget you. Look, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. God loves your children more than you do. And it is very, very hard to believe. We do know that this is an imperfect world, and there are a lot of imperfect people. There are some, some, some parents out there that have really blown it. There are parents that have abandoned their children or left their children. There are parents, this is a world where, unfortunately, there are, there are people trying to get rid of children before they get here. God loves you even more than mom does. And so we're about to take communion in a moment. And what I want you to think about is this last slide here. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. God allowed this mother to watch her son die up close and front and personally because of my sin. God allowed Mary to suffer something that that None of us would ever want to go through. And Cornerstone, we're not strangers, unfortunately. We're not a church that is strangers to to having some sons and daughters die. So you imagine the grief that we've been going through and the mourning that we've gone through in years past at this, and you think about the fact that God let it happen to himself. And not only that, his mother standing up close, front and personal, seeing what happened to her son because of the sins of the world. So as we take the bread that represents his broken body, we're about to take communion if the ushers want to go ahead and uh, get up. If we take the bread that represents his broken body, your mother loves you a lot. God loves you more. He let his son die. He let his son's body be broken. As we take the fruit of the vine that represents the blood of the new covenant, which was poured out for our sins, Think about how much God loves you. So again, today, hug your mom, love your mom, pray with your mom, pray for your mom. Mothers out there, love your husbands and children. Look to God to show you how to do that. Look to other women to show you how to do that. But ultimately, everybody in the room, remember that God loves you so much that he was willing to let Jesus die on a cross for your sins and for mine. Let's pray. God, I love how the scripture talks about you made them both, male and female, in your image. There are parts of of both sexes that are from you. We're made in your image. 
And God, I know that I love my mother so much. I love the, the, the mother that Natasha is to our kids. Mothers have such a special place in society. Think about Jesus praying for the, for the mothers, saying, hey, you know, when, when this tribulation comes, you know, woe to those who are nursing mothers. I mean, Jesus understands that it's hard to be a mom. So interesting when you look at the scriptures and the, the provisions, even in the Old Testament, after a marriage or after a birth, there were certain things that people were sort of let off the hook for. They didn't have to participate in the army during those times because you understand how important marriage and parenting is. And so, God, I'm so grateful for my mom. I'm so grateful for the mothers of Cornerstone, all the people that sacrifice time to get up here and make prayer blankets, that volunteer in children's classes, that come on Fridays and pray for our congregation, that serve as ushers, and in so many other ways, as greeters, and so many other ways that the mothers of this church serve. I'm so grateful for them, Father. Thank you. Please bless them. God, help them. Help them to, to love their, their husbands and children. And, and even if they're single moms, be with them in particular, Father, as they have a very, very tough road. And as we said, life is not perfect. No one says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign up to be a single parent. Sometimes stuff just happens. We live in a fallen world. Please be with them. Protect them. Help the, help the men and the brothers of the church to, to find ways to support them and help them with their children. But God, teach us. And finally, help us to know how much you love us. Even more, it's, it's so hard to believe, but God, you love us more than our own mothers. Help us to really, truly believe that, to feel that, to know that. That you're a God that was willing to give up his one and only son, who was perfect, who was perfect. We're not perfect, but he was perfect. And you're willing to give him up on a cross for our sins. Thank you that we can celebrate his broken body and his poured out blood that was shed for us. We thank you for this day. Please help us all to have a wonderful, wonderful Mother's Day. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.